It's a pleasure to um, be with you tonight. Um, it's, it's late night here in Leicester in the UK. We've been thinking about idiopathic VT ablation and, and uh, I'm going to share some data about new mapping tools. You've probably seen quite a lot of this. We, we were thinking about um, the classification of monomorphic VT in, in normal heart, which we would classify as uh, idiopathic VT, uh, according to the response to drugs. Um, so this is the first type, which is adenosine sensitive, which can terminate with adenosine over verapamil. The second type is sensitive to verapamil. Uh, typically, it is due to reentry and uh, the typical left ventricular fascicular VT that we know about. And the third type is sensitive to beta blockers like propanolol, which is driven by catecholamines, which can occur in left or right ventricle. Obstacle track tachycardias uh, are the bulk of the idiopathic VT that are VT occurring in the absence of structural heart disease. Typically driven by triggered activity due to calcium overload. The right ventricular outflow tract is the origin of this in the majority of the idiopathic VTs, being more common in women, um, typically of the age of 30 to 50. They cannot uh, present as VPCs or non-sustained VT uh, driven by catecholamines and therefore emotion and exercise where the autonomic nervous system is, uh, uh, plays, plays an important role. If you look at this um, figure, which is an anteroposterior uh, image of the right ventricular outflow tract, you can see the red region which demarcates the muscle of the outflow tract in the right side, just below the pulmonary valve. If you take this away, you can see that just behind it, you have the musculature here in red, which is of the left ventricular outflow tract region or aortic cusp. And therefore, arrhythmia sources coming from the LVOT or the aortic cusp can actually exit through its neighbor, which is the RVOT, and be behave or appear like RVOT, but the source is actually from behind. As we mentioned, it can be single ectopics, couplets, non-sustained VT, or it can be sustained VT. But always in the sustained VT situation where you have left one branch block, you need to be thinking about structural heart disease like sarcoidosis or in this case, um, the epsilon wave of RV dysplasia, where imaging plays an important role in um, the investigation of patients. So when we're assessing patients, we need to take the full history, examination, ECG, echocardiogram, and nowadays, I think most people would use an MRI scan to make sure there's no underlying structural heart disease. And certainly in um, assessing the need for treatment, uh, we would be thinking about arrhythmia burden because a high arrhythmia burden would then lead to a cardiomyopathy, a cardiomyopathy situation where the patient can develop LV dysfunction and heart failure. And this pa paper has demonstrated that um, a frequency of PVCs of 13% and above would be a good indicator that uh, even if they do, do not have LV dysfunction, they, they are likely to develop LV dysfunction over time. And therefore, that may be the threshold for intervention in terms of treatment. Looking at the distribution of RVOT, this is an early paper in 2005. There's a lot of RVOT that um, occur around the anteroceptal region, uh, just underneath the pulmonary valve. How do we know where they are or based on the ECG? You can use the lead one um, on the 12 lead and the QRS polarity. If the QRS is positive, then it's more likely to be coming from the posterior region of the RVOT. If it's negative, it's more leftward, therefore more anterior um, of the RVOT. Looking at the width of the QRS, if the duration is more than 140 milliseconds, then it's further away from the conducting system, and therefore more likely to be from the free wall, especially if the inferior leads uh, show notching of the QRS complexes. How do we know something may not be in the RVOT but from behind the, the, the LVOT or the, uh, the cusp region? 
if it's from behind, then you're going to start looking at and seeing R wave in the V1, which becomes fatter and taller. And this paper highlights uh, from, from the, uh, the Hamburg group, highlights uh, this feature called the R wave duration index, which measures the uh, width of the R wave on the isoelectric line compared to the total QRS duration. If it's more than 50%, then it's more likely to be coming from the cusp. And again, if the R wave is tall compared to the S wave, the RS amplitude of more than 30%, then it is more likely to be coming from the cusp. The VT from the RVOT can also be uh, coming from high up from the pulmonary artery area. This is where the, the, they are ablated in this example. So it's way above the pulmonary valve, but there is a fascicle that conducts down and exit through the RVOT, still giving you the appearance of a left bundle branch morphology and inferior axis. If it's coming from the left ventricular alpha tract, then you obviously would see a dominant R wave in V1. In the LVOT, it could be either above the valve or below the valve. If it's below the valve, then you'll see an S wave in V5 or V6, infravalve LVOT. But if it's above the valve, then it, is, um, uh, it does not have that uh, S wave in V5, 6. This is kind of a summary of what we see clinically um, in outflow tract tachycardias. The bulk of it, as I said earlier, comes from the RVOT, thankfully. But we are obviously seeing a lot of patients who have origin um, of the VT coming from the left ventricular outflow tract or the aortic cusp. They can also be coming from pulmonary artery, but thankfully it is a small uh, number. And they can also be coming from uh, around the coronary sinus area or the left ventricular epicardial surface. Can we tell from the ECG that it is coming from the epicardium? This paper uses, um, highlights uh, a, an index called the MDI, the Maximum Deflection Index, which looks at lead V3 of the ectopic or the VT, measuring from the beginning of the QRS to the peak of the R wave whereas uh, there is the be beginning of the intrinsicoid deflection as a proportion of the total QRS duration. So if this MDI is above 0.55, then it is more likely to be coming from the epicardium. And the thinking of it is because if it's coming from the epicardium, it takes time for it to reach the conducting system to cause the intrinsic deflection and therefore, the slow slur is more than 55% of the total cure restoration. Taking, thinking about treatment, obviously, um, uh, we can treat with drugs first if the patients are symptomatic or if the ectopics are frequent or they have VT. Uh, beta blockers, rapamil are quite effective. Uh, if drugs fail, then obviously we can be thinking about mapping and ablation. The success of ablation is not bad. It's been reported as um, at least 90%, 90-95%. But there is a recurrence rate, which is about 5%. Even with modern technology, I think this is still sitting around that number because um, quite often patients will come into the cath lab and the ectopics won't fire. You can't induce any VT, and therefore they have to go away and come back again. So this is uh, not an infrequent um, occurrence in idiopathic VT. In terms of the mapping approach, you can use pace mapping, but typically you would use pace mapping as a confirmation after you've done the endocardial activation mapping. Once you think that you may be on the spot, you would like to pace and reproduce the ECG morphology and therefore deliver energy at this site. But the problem with pace mapping is that you can get an exact pace match, even 12 over 12 on the 12 the ECG, over a large area of around the 2 centimeter squared mark. The QRS morphology 
of a pacing area over a 50 millimeter distance can also be identical. So there's a large margin of error. Therefore, making this an imprecise method um, for guiding ablation. So it's good for confirmation, but perhaps not the best to guide. If you're on the spot, this is a barred tr um, system tracing. You can identify the clinical arrhythmia or the ectopic and uh, create a template and ask the machine to do the 12 lead matching for you during the ma pace map. And this is coming up as 98% per match, which is not bad. But a more precise mapping would be activation mapping. But this requires the arrhythmia to be firing, the topics to be firing or the VT to be occurring. If it's occurring, you move the catheter around the heart to the location to try and get to the earliest location by timing, because if it is the origin of the arrhythmia, that would register the earliest uh, activation point. This is one such example. Again, we've got the template over here during the clinical uh, ectopic, the site of the ablation catheter registered a quite a nice bipolar electrogram, which is early compared to the onset of the QRS, and also the unipolar, which is red here, registers a very nice QS complex, suggesting this is a good site. In terms of ablation, we traditionally went for um, non-irrigated catheter. This is the, the, the evolution of the technology, using what we know from uh, SVT ablations of using around 50 watts and dialing up about 60 degrees. And we would wait for about 15 seconds um, or 10 to 15 seconds to, to see this response of acceleration, just as we would for um, slow pathway ablation for AVNRT. Because for triggered activity, using the old technology of non-irrigated catheter with resistive heating, you expect the heating to create a response from the arrhythmia before you actually terminate it. But I think nowadays most people would use an irrigated catheter because it gives you control. Uh, in the free wall, you probably use less power using 25 or 30 watts. But in the septal muscle bulk, you will use higher power of 40 watts and above. And with irrigated energy, it is more efficient. And because of the cool tip at the, at the irrigation, irrigated tip, you don't often get the acceleration. You can be killing the source of the arrhythmia without actually heating it up. Many groups have proposed um, ECG algorithms to help locate the source of the arrhythmia before we go into the cath lab to help plan uh, a mapping and ablation strategy. Frank Machinist's group in Philadelphia has probably done the most work here and this is one of the papers and this is one of the algorithms which um, is probably good for the cath lab wall uh, but it's quite difficult and challenging to commit to memory. But one feature is highlighted here called the V2 transition ratio. It's quite helpful in highlighting um, the fact that every single patient is different. And we should not take ECG algorithms for granted that it applies to every single patient because patients come in all different sizes and ages. Uh, the, the torso, again, the heart could be rotated, especially in young people. So this V2 transition ratio formula helps normalize the ectopic ECG against the patient's own sinus rhythm ECG. So if you look at the size of the R wave in, in the ectopic relative to the total QRS amplitude as a proportion of the same ratio during the sinus beat, if it becomes more positive if the A, which is the R wave in the ectopic, becomes bigger compared to the sinus beat, then it's more likely to be coming from the left ventricular alpha tract. So this is one of the features to highlight that we need to think about the patient and not just the ECG. There are other algorithms that uses, uh, that, that, that will help 
identified the left from the right. This is one that uses the, the kind of Brugada type thinking, moving the leads, the precordial leads up one space or down one space. When you compare the superior and the posterior, I've hidden this bit, you can see that there is a difference in the superior set here and the inferior set here where the R wave become dominant. Again, once you see a dominant R wave when you move the leads, then this is highly suggestive of a left ventricular origin, therefore the cusp rather than the RVOT. Another algorithm, um, which is not, which is a quite a simple uh, thing to look at when, when you go in, especially if the VT is occurring uh, or the ectopics are firing, is um, this coming from the, uh, uh, the Leipzig group, where they put a quadrupolar catheter at the right ventricular apex. So this is the RV apex with the electrogram during the ectopic. So if you look at the bipolar electrogram at the RV apex, if it's very late compared to the onset of the QRS, if it's more than 15 milliseconds compared to the uh, QRS onset, then it is more likely to be an LVOT origin. If it's RVOT origin, it will be occurring a lot earlier during the QRS or um, uh, certainly the, the, the first milli 50 milliseconds of the QRS. As I said, the algorithms are difficult to use, but this is the kind of mental algorithm I normally use. If I see an ECG with um, inferior leads that are positive, with an inferior axis, thinking that this is an alpha tract origin, and if the heart's normal, thinking of idiopathic VT of an alpha tract origin, OTT, alpha tract tachycardia, the first thing I look at is whether it's left bundle branch block or not. If it's left bundle branch block, then I'll be thinking of right ventricular alpha tract. If it's a right bundle branch block morphology, or it is the, the V1 is a little bit um, negative, but with an R wave, then I'm, with, I'm thinking about an LVOT origin. If there's n a, a, an S wave in V5-6, it's below the valve in infravalva LVOT. If there's no S wave in V5-6, it is above the valve LVOT. If the V1 is negative, but you start seeing a fat boy R wave or slightly taller R wave with an RS ratio of more than 30%, then it is a cusp origin. For both infravalva and RVOT, where you have the muscular outflow tract, I would also look at V3 on the precordial leads and think about the MDI, maximum deflection index. If it's more than 0.55, I think this may be coming from the epicardium rather than endocardium. With the mapping approach, as we see that um, the RVOT is still the more prevalent location for most of these idiopathic VT, I think it's good practice to start, especially if you are using a mapping system, to start using uh, mapping in the RVOT. This is an old Navix um, image uh, with the right atrium here at the back. You can see the golden color in that right ventricle. It's an LAO projection. You can see the red here of RVOT. It gives you an anatomical anchor of a geometry to start with. And if it is not in RVOT, my next port of call will be the coronary sinus. Because you're still using femoral venous axis, you're still in the venous vasculature, which is reasonably safe. You will go there and map in the coronary sinus, especially if the MDI is high, you're thinking about an epicardial source. But of course, once we go into the coronary sinus, using the coronary vein, coronary veins are next to coronary arteries, you need to be checking your coronary artery using selective coronary injection to make sure that your earlier spot or where you have a good activation and pace map is far enough from your uh, coronary artery. So after the coronary sinus and RVOT, my third 
location would be to look at the aortic cusp and the LVOT region. In this area, you obviously would need to do selective coronary injection to check that there's no coronary disease to begin with. You would also check the ostium uh, location of the left main um, and the right coronary artery for that matter if there's a right cusp origin. And I would normally want to do a, a good angiogram at the aorta so that I can see the cusp uh, and know where the mapping area is. So as we do more of these outflow tract arrhythmias, we know that um, we can have some surprises waiting for us. They're not all easy ones. The easy ones are easy. But the more we do, we will hit and see difficult ones. And there are some ECG clues, even before we start, of some difficult outflow tract cases. And I'll just highlight these three. The first one, um, well, th this is all to do with the, the, this area at the left ventricular summit. This area that's uh, subtended by a trigone area between the left anterior descending artery in the front and the left circumflex artery uh, on the side. So this region um, is a popular area for um, idiopathic VT to occur. It is just below the aortic cusp there and this LV summit area can be tricky. This ECG algorithm measures the depth of the Q wave of AVR and compared to AVL. As the AVL, Q, uh, AVL complex during the arrhythmia becomes more negative, therefore giving you a higher Q wave AVR AVR ratio, then it's more likely to be an epicardial origin. Another feature is called the R wave pattern break. And this is looking at V1, V2, and V3. So V1, you start off with an R wave that seems to go smaller in V2 and it appears again. So this is various examples of the R wave pattern break in V2. R wave there is getting smaller, getting big again. R wave, small, big. R wave, small, big again. And this is typical of an origin at the trigone area in the LV summit. And this is exactly where the lead V2 will be seeing. And because the origin is coming from there, it's a bit like a Q wave uh, equivalent of a unipolar. So you have a loss of R wave voltage in that particular lead. And because it's so close to this area in the LED, sometimes it is not possible to burn. Uh, even using an epicardial approach, it would be challenging because there's a lot of fat around this area, making ablation impossible. Even in the best hands, in the best centers, uh, the success rate may not be as high as what we normally uh, are familiar with uh, compared to RVOT. And the third ECG feature coming from this area, which is deeper, is the AMC area, the aortomitral continuity. And this gives you a very, sig a very classical signature of a QR complex in V1. You see a Q wave and then an R wave. A QR complex is a, a signature of an origin coming from the aortomitral continuity deep inside that trigone area. If it's deep, then um, you need to really take an anatomical approach. You may wish to use higher power in the RVOT because it's near the septal area. You want to explore the coronary sinus area to see whether it can reach it, or you need to go above or below the aortic valve in the LVOT to try and hit this deep aortic mitral continuity area. And certainly, if all else fails, you really need to be thinking about anatomy and the ECG is only helpful in guiding you to the area. How you deliver effective power, ablation power into the location uh, demands an understanding of that true geometry and anatomy. And therefore, 3D mapping will certainly help. 
with the f last few minutes, I'd just like to share some um, data that we have been um, fortunate to be uh, playing with. This is a new technology called Vivo, called View into Ventricular Onset, uh, which is a technology being distributed by Catheter Precision. Um, and it is a software-based ECG imaging system, which provides a 3D image of the heart superimposed on an activation map. This is what the uh, system would need. It would need an MRI scan of the patient's specific cardiac anatomy that is integrated with the patient's torso image taken by a basically a um, Sony Kinect camera that creates a tomogram of the patient's uh, photograph of the patient's torso with the ECG lead location being demarcated. These are integrated with the MRI scan image to give you a torso and a cardiac anatomy uh, geometry. You use the di digital ECG data of the ectopic or the VT to integrate into the system and it will give you a nice lacuna map of the origin of the ectopic. This is what the interface looks like on the machine. Again, MRI, torso, ECG, and then you get a map. I'll just give you a few examples. This is um, the patient and the vivo system with the ectopic. You can see a left one branch morphology here, inferior axis, quite classical RVOT origin. And this is the isochronal map showing the earliest point, which is demarcated in red, in a free wall location of the RVOT. Next is a patient where it is coming from the LVOT and you can see it is actually coming from the right coronary, right coronary cusp area being the earliest location. And this was then confirmed using a 3D mapping system and we managed to ablate uh, in the right coronary cusp. And you can see the benefit of this ECGI system very different to perhaps images that you are familiar with from the Cardio Insight system where you do not see the insight of the heart because the Cardio Insight system uses a monodomain mathematical model whereas the Vivo system uses a bindomain mathematical model that allows you to see inside of the surface of the heart, allowing you to see septum and therefore allowing you to see intracardiac structure. And we found this a particular unique feature uh, in patients that we mapped some left ventricular VT. And this example you can see a dominant R wave here in the precordial leads, uh, left axis deviation on the uh, limb leads suggestive of a left ventricular basal origin of the ectopic. And if you play this arrhythmia, play, play this loop in the vivo system, you can see the earliest point is in this structure here, which the MRI has shown us. This is the posterior medial papri muscle in the left ventricle. So the cardio insight will not be able to see inside of the heart. It will just be able to let you see the epicardial breakout. But with the vivo system, you can chop the heart out and see inside and clearly appreciate the origin of the arrhythmia, the tip of the periphery muscle coming down and then spreading over both ventricles. We've now used this system for about 18 months um, and we've managed to um, integrate the DICOM images from the system and the MRI scan and integrate it into our 3D mapping system. This is an example of this vivo map inside the CARTO system. And we can use the vivo map to guide our electroanatomical mapping inside the CARTO. And you can see the clear glass CARTO geometry and the Visitac where the ablation markers are left 
fully merged with the Vivo color map, which is the isochrono map. And you can see the origin of the uh, ablation site with very nice and early complex bipolar electrograms. We've also integrated this with the um, precision system. So this is possible. And again, the Vivo map was very helpful in guiding us to where we should be burning. So I hope I've crystallized some data uh, of our current understanding about the of ultra tract tachycardias, which form the bulk of the normal heart VT that we see clinically. But the more we see, the more we appreciate that regions outside the ultra tracts should be considered, especially for mapping if we are doing ablation. There are many algorithms which help us focus our mapping and ablation strategy. And the new technology with Vivo, I think it's very helpful, especially for pre-procedural planning, and especially addresses a troublesome feature of these normal heart VTs when the patients do not fire in the cath lab, but fire like mad when they are walking around. And the Vivo technology can certainly be integrated with a Holter 12 lead. So we can do an ambulatory 12 lead ECG and use that digital data to integrate with Vivo to give us uh, a clue and a head start of where the clinical arrhythmia is even before we go into the lab. And with that, I give you thanks for uh, your forbearance of that technical glitch. Uh, this is where I'm sitting here, very much in the heart of England in Leicester. Leicestershire, we've just been um, given an extra lockdown from the COVID situation. Um, you, you would know that we are also made famous by winning the Premiership um, several years ago and also dug up King Richard III from our City Council car park. I, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andre, for your very comprehensive talk. Um, I did prepare some questions some of them you've already answered mm. um, but there are some questions i'd like to ask first first of all uh, papillary muscle vt do you come across papillary muscle vt uh, very often do you ever use intracardiac echo to guide mapping and have you ever confused this uh, papillary muscle VT, particularly if it arises from the posterior papillary muscle with uh, vesicular VT. I've had some problems with a patient before, and I think that that was the case. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah. Thank you, Andre. Um, there are several questions there. Um, I think the first thing is, um, now before we use Vivo, I really could not think of um, the last case of papillary muscle VT we had because we probably didn't see it, we didn't appreciate it, we just say, oh, it was a difficult left ventricular VT, um, we, we got some difficulty, or we, we got a partial success. And since using Vivo over the last 18 months, we've collected seven cases, seven cases of papillary muscle VT. Because now that we can see it, we know exactly where it's coming from. I think it is out there. It's certainly clinically, they occur, they are there. Uh, typically, the right bundle branch spot morphology, left axis deviation, they're coming from the LV base. Mm -hmm. Now, to answer your second question about um, the uh, watershed area between fascicular and papillary muscle, especially the, the posterior fascicle, I think uh, the, the EP study is important and the behavior of the arrhythmia. Because obviously, for fascicular VT, which is a micro reentrance uh, mechanism, you are more likely to induce it with program stimulation or atrial pacing. And if you are, um, if you have all the electrodes there, you are fortunate enough. You, it gives you the beautiful sort of induction with the hiss bundle signal or the right bundle branch potential appearing and then disappearing. So. That, that EP study will give you a lot of uh, information about the mechanism 
and perhaps the differential diagnosis. And also, the fascicular VT tend to be very, well, it uses the normal conducting system. Therefore, by definition, they are a lot narrower uh, in terms of the QRS duration. Whereas the papillary muscle will, will, will depend on ventricular conduction, and therefore they are naturally broader in QRS duration. Uh, ice we don't use because um, we work in the National Health Service, which is uh, very cash-strapped, and uh, we haven't found a source, uh, a way of, uh, of uh, using intracardiac echo in a non-single-use non way. So uh, we, we don't normally use uh, intracardiac echo. Right. Can I uh, make a question? Andrea, yes, about, I, that, yeah. uh, about the uh, arrhythmias from ventricular arrhythmias from the uh, LV summit, and uh, how is what's your first approach to ablate them from the great cardiac vein, from the endocardio, from the aortic cusp, and also uh, these arrhythmias they have a high rate of recurrency. When it happens, what? You, your second approach when they come back to the lab with the same arrhythmia? Mm. Um, I would obviously, well, I, I, I shared with you my approach in terms of the mapping strategy. I would always start with the RVOT first, the right ventricular alpha tract, and look at the earliest um, timing of the arrhythmia and see, look at uh, the unipolar uh, feature. And then I would go to the coronary sinus and look at the great cardiac vein, the uh, AIV. And I think the, uh, if, if it is really a, an a epicardial source, the MDI is high, great. I'm quite happy with that. Because the, the issue with burning in the coronary sinus, as you would know, or the AIV, is that you can't use very high power. Um, even with the best irrigation, you can only dial up about 30, 35. I've tried 40 watts there, but you know, you're struggling to, to reach that e effective power. So if you're not on the spot, if it's actually deeper, like the summit tachycardia, which is not epicardial, not endocardial, but deep inside uh, that kind of pattern break area, then the 40 watts is not enough to touch it from the epicardial side. So then, then I would look into the LVOT, and again, above the valve or below the valve and get to the earliest location. Now, if it is genuinely that LV summit, deep intramuscular area, then none of these areas will give you the earliest point. And you may have the RVOT being early, but the LVOT is also equally early, telling you that it is somewhere between the LVOT and RVOT. Mm -hmm. So then you need to make an anatomical call. What I would normally do is to have, I, I'm not afraid of using high power, provided I've got a lot of muscle. So if I think that the LVOT infravalvar area is the closest spot, I would dial up power from there. I would go for 50 watts, 60 watts. I have used 70 watts irrigated in that irrigated. area. Um, but that is really sailing very close to the, the dangerous margin. Right. But it is very much in that paper that I just showed about the, the new K paper that you need to know the anatomy if it is really in that region, which I normally call the Bermuda quadrangle, not the, not the triangle, it's four areas. It is you know, RVOT, uh, uh, AIV above, below the valve in, in LVOT. So the four areas, you need to try and find that area that you can spray your irrigated power in the direction of that deep source, enough to kill it. Um, I think, you know, um, quite often the failure is because not enough power is delivered um, at a suboptimal site. So, uh, again, I think we need to think about the patient because obviously, ultimately, these are idiopathic VT. So the patient starts with a normal heart. If 
they are not very frequent, if there's no structural heart problems, if there's no cardiomyopathy, you need to balance the aggression against the prognosis. So if it's prognostically not that bad, the patient's not that symptomatic, you may want to continue to manage with uh, drugs rather than using a very aggressive strategy up with, uh, with a tragedy. tragedy. And even for the, the great cardiac vein or, or um, uh, mapping the coronary sinus, you know, I, I used to think oh, it's very safe. You know, um, I, I had one patient that I had to do a primary PCI um, at the time of the procedure. We checked the coronary artery. Um, there's no coronary artery disease, maybe a, a tiny plaque, 10% plaque. And I had at least you know, 10 millimeters uh, space between the ablation catheter and the coronary artery. We checked that before. We switch on the energy, and then the plaque ruptured, and, uh, and the patient had a, a lateral infralateral infarct, so we had to do a primary PCI. So um, we need to think about the coronary artery. So we can convert a normal patient into an abnormal, abnormal patient. So we need to be thinking about all these things, I think. Good. Andrea? Uh, my next question would be, because um, I, I remember the old days in Birmingham. <laughs> we used to do practically 90% of cases on the right side of the patient. And every day we, we see a, a, a new spot arising where we have to map. So my next question would be, the rate of complications now you're burning within the coronary sinus, above and below the aortic valve, many tricky areas. Do you have a lot of complications regarding these procedures where the spot is not usually the regular one? Mm. Well, I, I shared with you that, that um, acute infarct with the primary PCI. That's, thankfully, that's the, 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 the most uh, uh, you know, dramatic complication I've had from, from, from these uh, ventures. Um, I think the one thing to say is, as you know, these patients are young, you know, typically more, more women than men, you know, young girls who come into the lab. If I fail from the coronary sinus, uh, from, the, from the RVOT, um, I would map in the coronary sinus, um, but I need to be thinking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm raising the level of the, the, the risk every time I'm going to a different place. So that's why I, I, stay, I, I start with the RVOT, then I still stay in the venous vasculature map in the great cardiac vein. If there's clearly a very good site, site then I would go for the coronary artery uh, option to check. But mapping in the cusp and the LVOT, I may not do that as a first procedure. It depends on your conversation with the patient at the beginning. Because again, it depends on the symptoms. If it's the first procedure, the symptoms are not that bad, you really need to discuss with them about the potential complication. Because once you map in the cusp, in the LVOT, you're introducing systemic embolism as a genuine risk, stroke. So they need to know about these and weigh the, the risk against you know, the benefits. So um, yeah, I, th I think, it, if it's a young person with not so high a burden or not so high a burden of symptoms, I would stop at a, at a time I'm comfortable with and come back a second time. So because every time you, you go to, you know, from an RVOT, CS, cusp, then you, you're thinking about arterial, uh, you know, cannulation, systemic, embolis uh, systemic embolism risk, so I think this needs to be um, thought about in, in a stepwise manner. Uh, Andre, one of the uh, things that uh, come to my mind is uh, unstable VT. Yep. The ones that you can't map uh, precisely. And uh, also the, the PVCs that uh, trigger uh, VF. Mm. And uh, does your vivo system, it's, is it better to do these cases or just the same? How do you do it? 
Yeah, because we we, we had a well. I, I think if the number of primary VF with triclinic topics triggered VF that we've had, it's quite as uh, uh, you know as you would know. It's very alarming when they come in. They have multiple shocks, you know, and then you pour all the drugs into them and they quieten down. They come into the lab and nothing happens, <laughs> and you can't yeah. even induce it, you know. Uh-huh. So I think the Vivo is good technology um, outside of the cath lab. If the patients are firing in coronary care, for instance, if they're, you know, being monitored, they've got you can you can put on a digital ECG. We have been using the Motara, uh, twelve lead uh, holter system, which gives you a very good quality digital ECG, and you can record that. And if the patient's already got MRI information, you can integrate that and give you that head start oh. and a, a clue about about that that origin before you even go into the cath lab. So I think the vivo might well prove to be of particular benefit there and uh, did you ever had uh, tamponade due to perforation of the coronal sinus or venous system ablating mm, i can't think of any no it's quite safe yeah the coronal sinus is actually quite i mean as we know from crt you know in our early days of crt we dissect the coronary artery uh, the, yeah. the coronary, uh, coronary sinus quite a lot Without any catastrophe, and um, I, I it, it, especially with irrigated ablation, it doesn't pop really. If you if you use the irrigation um, carefully, and obviously if you get stuck in a corner and still keep burning, then obviously it can pop. But if there's no steam pop, then actually it's a very safe area. The only thing to worry about or think about in the coronary sinus is the coronary artery. The What's the, uh, the the highest power you used for the coronal sinus? Forty irrigated scatter, forty. Forty, right. yeah. Especially in the AIV area, I think if you are in the great cardiac vein with a little bit more uh, flow, when we used to do uh, quite a lot of coronal sinus lines for AF, um, you can arguably use higher, but you don't really need higher out there. If you think just ablating the CS uh, musculature, forty watts is enough, but in the AIV, you want to hit the myocardium, the ventricular myocardium, then um, 40 watts is only just about enough. And that's why, in my experience, it's only useful if you are really on the spot. If it's further, you know, deeper than the surface, the epicardial surface, then, you know, even 40 watts is not going to touch it. Have you ever had any problems with the aortic cusps? Mm. Um, perforation or damage to the valve or something like that? Not really. I mean, we, we think about it because obviously you're worried about the left main coronary artery. Um, so that's why you know, some people um, plug a Judkins in into the left main as, as a kind of a, a fail safe and then map with uh, the roving catheter. But you then need two uh, femoral art- arterial axis to do that it is quite cumbersome um, you know I think especially with mapping systems there's a lot of options there are mapping systems that integrate with your x-ray system um, for for Carto you've got a uni view so it's quite good that you have the x-ray on top of your your mapping system that gives you quite a lot of resolution there in that area um, so it's actually quite safe, and when I'm ablating, there's a lot of muscle there. Uh, I'm not afraid of using sort of, you know, even 50 watts as a start in the cusp. Um, but obviously, you need to make sure that the catheter is, is stable. You don't slip into the, the coronary ostium. Just one last question from, from me. Um, do you always use irrigated catheters and... Contact force catheters for, for these type of procedures. I would normally use um, a, a catheter that gives you the flexibility. So I'm more familiar with the well, not more. I, I suppose over time I'm using both Carter and Precision, but in terms of the modern day, but everybody wants to use force uh, catheter, then I would I would be using kind of a, a DF. Um, smart touch type catheter that gives you the two types of curves. The issue with that is 
Once you start with the DF, and that's the, probably the smallest bidirectional catheter you've got, then it limits what you can do in the uh, coronary sinus. Because again, that's quite a stiff catheter, and you may find that it is more difficult to navigate through the AIV. Um, so if I have a choice, I would use a B-curve catheter uh, of, of an irrigator to go to the AIV. If you think that it is the AIV, you must go down the AIV, then you may need to give up the force option. Because, you know, I, I don't think there's a B-curve force option. And when you're there, you're not talking about force anyway. But you, to, you need maneuverability, I suppose. Yeah, you, you need to really go down. And also, when you want to go to LVOT, especially in young girls, I keep coming back to young females, they've, they've, the, the anatomy is smaller, then you need the flexibility of a, of a B-curve catheter to cross the valve. Otherwise, you're going to create all sorts of complications for yourself and make the, 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 the procedure a lot more challenging. Uh, so there, uh, there is a question a, a little bit away from the, uh, the, the topic of your talk today, but uh, uh, what's, you have any experience with uh, the stereotactic uh, radiotherapy for ventricular arrhythmias? Uh, as, a, as a center, we haven't got any experience at all. Um, but certainly, I think coming back to the vivo system, uh, we have had some discussion with uh, the company and we, we are helping with some of the thoughts about that because as you know, the, the Kukulik uh, paper, they, they have been using the ECGI. I don't think they're using the cardio insight system, but it's a similar uh, system, the Yoram Rudy uh, type of uh, biosemi system for um, mapping. But in terms of radi radiotherapy, I think um, the current limitation is on the resolution of the therapy because I don't think you can really do pinpoint um, ablation. So it is an area, it's a voxel which is quite a, a big volume. Um, but in those patients that you will select for radiotherapy, they're probably too sick for a catheter procedure and therefore the heart is really bad and probably doesn't ma matter if you make it a little bit worse with your, your radiotherapy because it's really a palliation um, to, to reduce the number of shocks. But I think um, the technology is there to locate the breakout of the VT with these non-invasive strategy. So with a non-invasive mapping going with non-invasive uh, ablation, it makes sense. Do you have uh, some experience with, uh, with vivo system to epicardial source? Um, yes, um, I, I should have shown you an example. It's actually quite quite nice the way that the uh, vector of that uh, vivo system is actually able to re resolve the thickness across the myocardium. So it actually can show us an epicardial source rather than endocardial source. So we're quite, we, we're, learn, we're still learning about the system, but we're quite pleasantly surprised that it can <laughs> actually give us that. And I think the, the, the best example, uh, which I, I didn't include in the presentation, was, was one where we had a very low RVOT source, which is next to the HIS uh, bundle. And again, the VIVO system can actually resolve that between the RVOT origin and the HIS bundle breakthrough. So it's actually very nice. So we talk about sort of two or three millimeter there. So that resolution, it can resolve that. Okay, I think that wraps it up for tonight. It's uh, half past 12 in Leicester, am I right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we, on behalf of the uh, association, yeah, ABEC, Brazilian Association of uh, Cardiac Stimulation, we would like to thank you again, Andre, for the lovely talk and for the patience to start over your presentation because of technical problems. Yes. And obviously, we are still having the online uh, international symposium, and you are automatically invited, right? Uh, and um, if anyone else would like to say anything else, if not, we are releasing you so you can enjoy your new house.
Thank you. I'd just like to say, say thank you, Andre, and thank you, Alberto and Cristiano and Stella for the um, invitation and the wonderful reception. Um, apologize for the technical glitch, but I've enjoyed the interaction today and it's a pleasure to be with you. And I hope we can meet in person uh, once, once the, uh, the, we, we are in better times, once the COVID has blown over and I'll see you soon. Absolutely. We were, we were looking forward to welcoming you here in Fortaleza, sure. but unfortunately the pandemic screwed everything up. So. Absolutely. No, th yeah. there will be a time that we, we can meet again properly. Absolutely. Thank you, Andre. Thanks very much, Andre. Thank very you. nice. Excellent. Take care. Bye-bye. Take Have care. Be safe.